Good morning. It is a pleasure to welcome you here to worship at Wilton Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here. I want to show you or share with you some ways that we can dedicate our lives to service and fellowship and love. We have a number of uh, opportunities to, to give back. Uh, we have the gift card collection for Wilton Social Services for holiday, uh, holiday meals and whatnot. Uh, the, the Wilton Soldier Services gets lots of actual food donations from various entities, but they ask for those of us who'd like to support them to bring in gift cards. Uh, so throughout this week, you can bring in gift cards, you know, put, leave them in an envelope, slip them under the door, just say, uh, you know, WPC, uh, for, you know, just put four WPC, slip them under, or you could bring them next Sunday, uh, anytime between now and next Sunday. Uh, we will be giving them to... Wilton Social Services, the week that begins Sunday the 17th. So sometime during that week, we'll, we'll drive them over there. Also have uh, today an opportunity for those who are younger to give back in worship uh, by participating in our Christmas pageant. The first rehearsal is today, immediately after church. As soon as we get out of here, the kids come down here. So uh, 11.15 or thereabouts, possibly earlier than that. Uh, we will have our first rehearsal. All of the rest of the rehearsals are in that uh, events bulletin, which if you haven't got one yet last week, you can grab it on the way out in the basket outside. Christmas pageant here. Uh, we have, and really exciting, a interactive movie night on this coming Friday, November 15th. We need you, if you're interested in attending, to scan this QR code so we can make sure we have enough uh, Surprises and treats and whatnot for everyone. That should be a lot of fun. Uh, you've watched The Wizard of Oz before, but never like this. Let's just put it that way. And if Jessica were here, she was going to come down in a big bubble with a gown. And, and she's like, oh, shoot, I have to, I'm not here this weekend. So you just have us saying, you know, you got to come check it out. But it'll be a lot of fun. So sign up if you're interested in that so we can plan accordingly. Or the announcements, are there other announcements? Anybody else? Next Sunday, we will have some special guest musicians with us, um, a group of 12 young men who are from Sacred Heart University, the Bensonians, and they'll be singing as part of the service. So I just want you to be inviting people. Uh, it's, it's an a cappella group, and um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. This uh, thank you, and uh, let us begin our worship of God with our prelude.
word of encouragement came from prophet to people. Live a life that is full. Build, plant, eat, love, multiply. Pray for your communities. Be God in the center of all that is. We enter into worship today with hope in our hearts. For something happens here that reminds us that we can live as God desires. God has made a promise of faithfulness to us, and we can trust the promise. In our confession today, we are not confessing things for which we need to feel personally guilty or individually responsible. Rather, we are acknowledging what life is often like in an imperfect world. Our confession this morning is a responsive one. I will make a statement, and then you will respond with, that's how it is. Shall we try it? I will make a statement. Genius. Let us pray together. We find ourselves separated from our sisters and brothers. There are lines drawn between us that are racial, that are social, that are economic. We live cut off from many sources of strength and power and often feel that we cannot act. So many things call to us, grab for our attention, that we find ourselves attached, stretched to a fine, thin line. Our time is fragmented. Our lives are fragmented. We are broken. Yet in the face of all of this, we seek out the dawning of our liberation. Our God, our liberation, that's how it is with our lives. We seek the power of your Spirit, that we might live in fuller union with you and our sisters and brothers, and that we may gain courage to love and to act. Amen. Friends, the good news in Christ is that God offers us life at every moment, forgiving us, inviting us to the freshness of new beginnings. Let us praise this God of grace. And let us praise by sharing a sign of God's peace and love with one another. The peace of Christ be with each of you. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. Listen for the word of God to you. As he was teaching, he said, Watch out for the legal experts. They like to walk around in long robes 
They want to be greeted with honor in the markets. They long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. They are the ones who cheat widows out of their homes. And to show off, they say long, long, long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. Jesus sat across from the collection box for the temple treasury and observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. One poor widow came forward and put in two small copper coins worth a penny. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than everyone who's been putting money in the treasury. All of them are giving out of their spare change, but she from her hopeless poverty has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Be to God. Please pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable to you. You who are our strength and our salvation. Amen. So I recently came across a quote by philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Don't ask where, I just came across it. But anyway, it's been rattling around in my head this week. And this is the quote, it's not long. Pleasure disappoints, possibility never. Pleasure disappoints, possibility never. I think about Christmas morning, seeing the wrapped presents around the tree, imagining what might be inside. This is, for me anyway, often better than the aftermath when I'm surrounded by my stuff. Yes, it's nice, but even when the stuff is really nice, or something I really wanted, there's always this twinge. A guilt? I don't know, emptiness? Just this kind of eh, let down. Pleasure disappoints. Possibility never. Taking a walk at a beautiful vacation destination with my spouse, passing beautiful house after beautiful house and conversing about which one we would buy and which one isn't quite perfect. You know, the, the deck just doesn't go out quite far enough over there. And somehow not talking about the repair and renovation costs, the taxes, the overall financial strain of maintaining a second home. It would be immediately a part of actually owning it. Pleasure disappoints. Possibility never. Having a brilliant idea for a screenplay with amazing characters, a dynamic plot, it would absolutely be a breath of fresh air to the entertainment industry. And then, when you finally get that modicum of free time located and you can start writing, pop down in a comfortable spot, some chips, and watch the Knicks game instead. Pleasure disappoints, possibility never. My sons might tell you that my mantra these days is, there's a cost to everything. I feel like I've been noticing things that engender this thought a lot recently. So perhaps it's not surprising that I think this idea that there's a cost to everything may be part of what Kierkegaard is trying to get at with these words. Pleasure disappoints, possibility never. Living in that land of possibility, imagination, ideas, is always wonderful. But when those ideas get concretized, moved into the physical domain of what's real, what's tangible, there's often disappointment. Disappointment, I would argue, because it's at that point, the point of physically experiencing one of those ideas, 
that the cost often comes into play, whether it's an actual financial one, a mental one, whatever. When something is real, so is the inherent cost. And that cost can seem to suck the magic, the freedom, or the mystery out, whatever it is. It's into this landscape of the costs of reality crushing dreams. The today's passage from Mark about the widow and her two small copper coins comes. We see the rich people throwing in to the treasury lots of money. But it's not them, but the widow who Jesus commends unequivocally, saying all of them, rich people, All of them are giving out of their spare change, but she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. The hope, the possibility of this passage might be interpreted to be that, reading about the widow's actions, we're inspired to dedicate all the financial resources we have to God. But then there is the cable bill, and the groceries, and college tuitions, and car payments, and, and, and. And the cost of following the dream which Jesus lays out through the widow's action is destitution. Thankfully, however, I don't think this passage is really about money. Yes, it involves money, but it's not about money. The key is in the Greek word that's translated as what she needed to live on, widow, what she needed to live on. In the context of the passage, we might assume that that refers to something financial, but it actually doesn't. The word at the heart of this translation is the Greek word bios. We hear it as a prefix in biography. Biology, biome. Literally, it means the manner, the way in which one lives, in its totality. Life is something different. This is the way, everything about how one lives, by us. So, what Jesus is commending here with the widow is not the amount she gives, not the money at all. Jesus does not commend the widow for what she gives. He commends her for what she gives up. The widow gives up everything she has to maintain her life, choosing to dedicate and devote it to God. As Jesus might say, and the Mandalorian definitely would, this is the way. Everything has a cost. But God does not operate according to the economy of this world. Because following the way of Christ is, in a profound way, to cease the pursuit of pleasure. To engage in the pursuit of goodness instead. The pursuit of justice. The pursuit of love. The pursuit of hope. Possibility itself. Jesus commends giving up a way of living, as the widow does. A way of needing the things of this world to give one's life significance, or value, or pleasure. And instead commends for entrusting her life to God. Recognize again that this is not about money. One can give up one's manner of living without forcing one's family to move into a minivan in the Walmart parking lot. To give all, as the widow does, is to give up on defining the value of one's life by what one has, or by one's accomplishments, or by one's legacy, and instead defining it by our attempts to follow what God requires of us. Right? We've heard it from Micah, to do justice, embrace faithful love, walk humbly with our God. 
Our task is to identify what is it in our lives that stops us from doing this, and to whatever degree we can, with the goal being, with the widow, completely, to give that thing or those things up. The promise of Scripture is that unlike the way just about everything else in life works, when we make choices to live as God and Christ calls us to live, I don't think there really is a cost. Certainly, writing a check as part of a stewardship campaign, for example, does cost us something, of course. But only literally. It does not have a cost in a way that leaves us questioning or causes us disappointment or that we find stressful after we write it. At least it shouldn't, anyway. When we give something up to help someone with less live more equitably, yes, we no longer have whatever that is, funds, a particular privilege, advantage. But if we've given it up willingly in love, What meaningful sense is there a real cost to doing that? I'm not suggesting that giving up one's life as the widow does is easy by any means. We have a child that wants us to support them in a sporting event, but we feel we must choose to care for a sick parent instead. It's far from clear which one of those things is better to do. And it certainly seems like, in either case, whichever one we choose, there's a potential for somebody to experience a cost, regardless of what we choose. I wonder, though, if, for example, a a conversation with the child after the fact about that decision to visit the sick parent instead, how it was difficult to make that decision, how important it was to make that decision. Maybe that would prove instructive and valuable to both the parent and the child. might even reveal that the cost, though perhaps temporarily painful, was fleeting. The widow's a model for us and is a meaningful one in the ways that truly matter. This isn't about whether we're willing or unable to empty our bank account. In addition, I don't want you to hear what I'm saying today as we're not doing enough. We need to do more. We need to give more. The challenge of today's scripture passage from Mark is not one of guilt. It's one of opportunity. It's a challenge of and to hope. It's an opportunity for us to consider what might we be able and then willing to give up? Perhaps tangible things, but also perhaps ways of thinking. Commitments to certain rights or perspectives that we cling to as unassailable. We have to have this. We have to, this has to be true. Whatever we might be clutching because we're afraid what it might cost us to release. And then instead, Trusting that if we give whatever it is up, our manner of living might be more closely aligned with the teachings of God in Jesus. And we might discover, we might consider that the cost isn't much of a cost. Perhaps not even a cost at all. Now I know, especially when we are tired, when we are disappointed when we're confused, when we're anxious, when we're uncertain. It can be difficult to seriously consider this sort of reorientation to which today's scripture lesson might be pointing us. When we're lost, when we're not even really sure what we have, it can be very hard to consider what we might give up. That's okay. The widow's work to which we are called is work for a lifetime, not just a moment. There is time, and it will take time. We can engage when we're ready. 
Pleasure disappoints. Possibility never. God does not disappoint. Ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. This particular anthem um, has a lot of meaning for me personally. Um, bring us to your light, and I think it's timely for our role in the world.
God, we bring these offerings because of the love you have poured out on us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Your gift calls for a response that cannot be contained in envelopes or baskets. Nothing less than all we have and all we are is good enough to dedicate to your will and purposes. So with fear and trembling, yet with joy, relief, and gratitude, we bring you all we have to give, ourselves. Use us that your love might be realized among all people. Amen. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. God, creator of this spinning globe peopled by humankind, all of whom you love, hear us. Hear us on this new day at the beginning of an era that is potentially fearsome, maybe even dangerous. Forgive us as individuals, forgive us as congregations, as congresses, as state departments, as leaders, as common ordinary citizens. Forgive our reliance upon ourselves and our own resources for the management of our disagreements. Forgive us on our dependence on violence and violent rhetoric for settling conflicts. God, enter all those places in our world where there is strife, where there is discord, where there is death, all that is counter to you. God, we pray that you would soften, that you would change minds and hearts, Pray that you would change ours. God, we pray that you would change all of us. Change us from defenseless to defended. From fearful, confident. From closed, open, from shaken to courageous, courageous in the risk and work of establishing peace, justice, and equality right here, over there, everywhere. God, we pray that you would be with us. We might feel your spirit in every breath we take. That we might know whenever we stagger, whenever we are unsteady, you are there. That you promise us a better world, a better way. If we can just accept it, look for it. 
in hope. We pray for all those in this community who we know are in special need of your blessing and your healing. All those listed in our bulletin and those whose names we lift up to you in the silence of our hearts. God, we offer all our prayers to you using the words that Jesus Christ taught us. Say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not. from evil. Power.